It's been a while since we've been out to the Constein farm in Perkins, Oklahoma, so we decided we'd come back and visit with Bob about his specialty, and that's growing pumpkins. Now, Bob, how in the world did you come up with pumpkins like this during a unique growing season that we've had like this year? Well, all I can say it was probably right living. Uh, <laughs> we thought we'd lost this crop two or three times before we got it in, and uh, it wasn't warm enough. Uh, the pumpkins ripen by how hot it is, and so they didn't want to get ripe, but then it was so wet, we had so many foliar diseases, that the leaves all died, and that caused them to ripen. And as it turns out, we've got a great crop, and they've ripened just on time. Now, one of the unique things, Bob, that I find about your farm is that you grow pumpkins in the same place year after year, and we mm -hmm. usually encourage people to rotate out the crop. Basically, you do by adding other crops in it. Tell us about your planting season throughout the year. Okay, we're, we're basically forced into this. The fields near the home are the only ones that people can get to easily. We're cut off by a creek, but we rotate uh, sweet corn in the spring, followed by pumpkins, and then a winter cover crop of uh, rye and Austrian winter peas. And for 10 years running now, we've seen no increase in disease, and the productivity's been the same. So something in that combination must mm -hmm. be right. Okay, now you're using on your sweet corn, you're doing some trials with sweet corn, ornamental corn, but you're using short or early maturing yes. varieties, is that correct? Yes, uh, you don't have time to grow that much stalk. So we plant the 1st of April and we'll be finished harvesting by the 1st of July. And there are good uh, uh, sweet corn varieties that will do that, okay. and that's what we have to use. And you put in your pumpkins. Now, of course, we're familiar with your uh, cattle panels where you arch those and grow pumpkins and or gourds I guess on those mm -hmm. but you've added what herbs to the farm since we've been here last time tell us a little bit about your wife's project okay it's kind of a natural outgrowth you see no one really needs a pumpkin uh, it's something that pumpkins do they make you feel good and herbs fall into the same natural progression there's no minimum daily requirement for herb but it's almost universal, the smells and the taste that just contribute to the quality of life. And they go with this really well. And we have about 200 varieties now okay. of herbs growing in the garden. And uh, then in addition to the herbs, uh, the pumpkins and gourds, you tell me you're doing a little bit of studies on different types of ornamental corn. Is that correct? Yes, looking for uh, natural earworm resistance. Um, um, ornamental ear of corn, it looks kind of bad if the earworms have chewed on it. But we don't want to. Uh, make the cost of raising it too high. Okay. So if we can find natural resistance, it's what right. we're looking for. Now another project you tell me about is your beneficial plots. Why don't we take a look at those and you can show us what you've got going on. What, another location? Yeah, let's go up there. I'm really happy with these. Okay, thanks. Steve, these are the plots I wanted to show you. We're really interested in this. This is the first year we've ever done anything like this. Uh, the uh, Kerr Center for Sustainable Agriculture and the Rodale Institute uh, were able to get a proposal funded to study uh, uh, plots of uh, beneficial uh, flowers and herbs uh, to see if they could increase the population of beneficial insects in a given area. There have been some growers reported that they've been using these herbs and flowers to uh, tilt the balance in their favor and to raise uh, crops without uh, using any sprays, which is certainly cheaper for them and uh, reduces the pesticide load and would be a more sustainable practice. And we're in a real learning situation here, never having grown anything like this or looked at the insects. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Tell us some of the different types of plots that you have. I understand there's herbs and, and flowers both. You want to mention a few of the different ones, like we're standing in yeah, a plot of dill. This is some dill and there's some uh, basil back there. The flowers. Um, these are bachelor buttons. There's some of uh, the wildflower mixes that the various right. companies sell, and they seem to do real well, as you can even see today, late in the season, attracting a whole host of different bugs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, some of them are also used as cover crops. I understand, like, you have buckwheat yes. and rye, so your uh, experiment will even go into the winter months, and I guess. Yes. Uh, there's so much unknown at this point. But we hope that these plots will provide the beneficial insects with nectar and pollen when there are no uh, uh, bad bugs, I guess you would mm -hmm. say, to prey on and to okay. serve as a food supply. So again, you're just trying to attract beneficials into the garden, and then you're trying to collect them to identify what you're coming up with. Let's, uh, I okay. found it interesting. Let me hand you your net here, and why don't you uh, show us um, 
how you do that in, in your sweeping there, what you're doing okay. to collect your insect. This is just a basic sweep net. And what I like to do is bump the, the uh, flowers or the herbs a little bit just ahead of the net. And we'll try not to collect the bumblebees today <laughs> and just to see what we can find. It's kind of like an Easter egg hunt, not knowing what you're going to get. This is a bed of Gallardia. Right, which is Indian blanket, the mm -hmm. state wildflower. Okay, and I would pinch these together. And we've got a spider here, we'll let go. They're uniformly beneficial. So you're grasping it so nothing will escape, mm -hmm. basically. And we'll put it in here to see what we've got. So you're pushing it into a bag mm -hmm, that has a okay. ziplock okay. on it. The insects are doing their part, but uh, the farmers are still learning. And and I think that's been your most interesting part, isn't it, Bob? That you're actually learning to identify the good and the so-called bad insects, and. Uh, with your studies. Now, you recently went down, what, a week ago to get some more training on this? Yes. Um, things are much more complex than I had uh, <laughs> counted on before. The insects are tiny, their interrelationships are very complex, and just to uh, identify them is a real problem. All right. Now, I know a fact sheet that you're using here um, through the extension service has helped out a lot, yes. too, and then you've got some samples of various parasites and predators. Anything interesting that you see in here so far? Let's see. None of the beneficials that okay. I am uh, really familiar with. Uh, some of them are quite tiny. The, the predatory wasps are very tiny. And right, you so you need a magnifying glass too. How, how long do you expect this experiment to really take? Uh, uh, it's scheduled to run three years, and okay. it's probably a good thing because we have to, to learn the ropes too. And then as the object is to uh, be able to raise our vegetable crops. We're not just in this for the flowers, to be able to raise the vegetable crops uh, better, right. that we'll try to you know, work it into that aspect. Well, Bob, as usual, you've got a lot of exciting things going on here, especially very timely projects for this time of year, and we want to thank you for having us out. And that's all the time we have today, and we hope you'll join us again next weekend here on Oklahoma Gardening.